You know, I always like to ask how many people brought your Bibles today. Put them up there. Let's see what we got. You got a few of them good. You know, this is what's important. This is the sword of the spirit. Doesn't do you any good having your Bible at home when you come to church. Uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to turn to Matthew 6, 24. I'll be reading from the new King James Version. Matthew 6, 24. Suffer. <laughs> No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Well, good morning again and happy Sabbath. When my children were still living with me, it seems like ages ago, uh, we had pets like guinea pigs, we had rabbits, one time we even had a pet rat, and we had cats, that, that, that pet rat was the bomb, That's, I'll, I'll share that for another, but anyway, we had cats, and, and as you know, that can be with little children sometimes, who normally cleans up after these animals? I, I saw the look right there. Yes, the parents do it. The parents do it. And so one time my children said, Dad, can we have a dog? And I said, no, go, guys. You know, I'm the one, you know, your parents are the one cleaning the rabbits. Your parents are the one cleaning after the cat, etc. A dog is a lot more responsibility. But Dad got overridden. And one day I come home, and there's this beautiful dog, half, uh, half German shepherd, uh, and, 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 I was told, I was given the story uh, that, you know, we need to find a home for the dog and it's just going to be here three days. And I said, no, go. I, I know what's going to happen within three days. You're all going to be so attracted, so attached to this dog. Uh, and, and they gave it a name. They gave her a name. They called her Gracie. And, 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 I, and, and well, three days passed and no home was found. And so by default, guess what happens? Gracie is, is at our place. And I w I'm Mr. Mr. Stalwart Dad and whatnot. I said, to me, that dog, his name is Dog. That's it. So I called her Dog all the time. Uh, they called her Gracie. Well, guess who became the most attached to that dog? She became my running buddy. She became, you know, a, a, she listened to me all the time. I, I would say, hey, you want to go for a walk? And she knew exactly what that meant. Ears popped up, head, head turns. Yeah, I, I, I want to go. Well, one day, my daughter and I felt we did a little experiment, okay? She's accustomed to being called Gracie, accustomed to being called Dog. And so we're on opposite ends of the living room, uh, and I'd say, Dog, come here. And she'd start coming to me. And then she would say, Gracie, come here. She'd turn around and start coming to her. Dog, Gracie, Dog. You know, it, was just, it was just fun doing that. <laughs> yeah, I know, we're tormenting the dog. Well, <laughs> she, was, she listened to two names. She listened to two voices. Well, today I want to tell you that there are two voices calling for you today. Two voices that are speaking in your ears. I don't think they're necessarily calling you dog, but there are two, vo two voices calling for you. And each points us on a different path. Each gives us some promises. One voice promises you a life of assurance, a life of peace a life of stability, a life of security. The other voice promises you a life of ease, a life of luxury, and also suggests a life of security as well. Each are seeking to be your master. And today I want to ask, who is your master. Let's turn our Bibles, if you haven't already, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It's been read for us already, uh, but sometimes I know some people don't open their Bibles to the speaker until the speaker speaks. Don't take it personally, Jim. Don't take it personally. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. We've looked at a couple of allegories or, 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 or uh, allegories in the Sermon on the Mount, each dealing with worldly goods. One talks about treasure in heaven and treasure on earth. Another one talked about the eye being the lamp of the body. This one now we're going to go and it's going to bring out some more things on this. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other or he will hold to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. Well, what is, first of all, I want to start with, what is this word mammon? It comes from the Greek memonas, and some believe it has a Syrian origin. Uh, and some believe that it is a Syrian god of riches. It gives you an idea of what, this, what, is, what is being meant here, what it, what it is meant by that. Well, there's a parallel statement in Luke chapter 16, uh, and if you can uh, move over there, I got a couple of book, uh, bookends here. Luke chapter 16, Jesus gives the same statement. You cannot serve God and mammon. And notice how some respond to that. Luke chapter 16 and verse 14. Now when the Pharisees, who were what? Lovers of money. When they heard these things, they derided him. This gives you an idea of what mammon may well be. Those who were lovers of money derided this statement of Jesus. I want to jump back to verse 11 in Luke chapter 16. Luke, uh, Luke 16 and verse 11, notice what it tells us there. Jesus speaking says, and, and it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's in a sense a climax, uh, end note, a conclusion of a parallel he gave. He said, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the what? unrighteous mammon who will commit to your trust the true. So here we get another idea of what is meant by mammon. Jesus refers to it as unrighteous, but it is unrighteous in a sense of what people make of it. It is not unrighteous in and of itself. For example, money itself is not evil, okay? It is not evil to be rich but it is evil if we make it an obsession. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. Let's go back to uh, Matthew 6, verse 24. That's what Jesus is telling us here. Mammon is unrighteous when we make it a higher priority than Christ in our lives. That's what Jesus is bringing out here. Now, whether you know it or not, we are inevitably servants. We are going to serve one thing or another. God invites us. God requests of us that we give him the opportunity to take control in our lives. Not because he's egotistical, not because he is a control monger, but for our good, for our welfare. But we may refuse with the idea that we want control in our life. That's the way I was for years. Uh, I, know, I knew to be a Christian, I had to surrender, uh, surrender control in my life. But I said, no, I want to be in the, in the driver's seat. I want the one to have the steering wheel in my hand. So we may refuse, like I did for years, with the idea that we're going to have control ourselves. But this is a delusion. This is a deception. The truth is, the heart that has not been transformed by Christ, the heart that is not converted is a heart that is enslaved, whether it realizes it or not. And the heart which is not a servant to God is going to be a slave to its own mammon. What Jesus is telling us here in this allegory no man can serve two masters. What Jesus is telling us here is that you cannot have two top priorities. Top priority means top. It means first. It means foremost. We cannot be living for wealth, obsessed with wealth, and living for Christ at the same time. The two are incompatible with one another. There is no, there is no overlap between the two of them. Only one king can occupy a throne at the same time. Have you heard of what's going on in Venezuela nowadays? In Venezuela, there is an election that recently took place, and the National Assembly uh, felt that this election was a fraud, and so they put up a man as acting president, Juan Guaido. Uh, they put him up as acting president, but the incumbent, 
the man who was president, Nicolas Maduro, says no, the election was right, and I was voted back in as president in Venezuela. And so you have some countries who are recognizing Guaido as acting president, some countries that are recognizing Maduro as president. There is no country that recognizes both as president. We cannot have two presidents. We cannot have two kings. We cannot have two top priorities. What is the determining factor? What makes us servants of God? What makes us servants of mammon? And Jesus points this out in this allegory. Again, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and what? Love the other. This is a determining factor. Who have we chosen to love? Who have we chosen to hate? This is the, the big determining uh, factor. But let me, let me point out, what does he mean by love? First of all, I want to point out what love is not. Love is not what I felt for the first girl that I was head over heels for, okay? It isn't those warm butterfly feelings. It is not that, you know, the, what is it, the birds, uh, the birds that are flying around the head? Oh, that's when you get knocked out, isn't that? I can't remember the cartoons, but... Yeah, the, uh, but it, it's, not, it's not the sentimentalism that is with butterflies, not birds. Okay, maybe that was it. It's not that sentimentalism uh, that, that is so often associated uh, with love. Well, what does Jesus mean by love? This verse is in what's called a, a chiastic structure. Let me, under, let me explain what I mean by a chiastic structure. It is when thought A is expressed and then thought B and then thought B is repeated, and then thought A. But in this case, we have three thoughts, okay? A, B, C, and then C is repeated, then B is repeated, and then A, okay? No man can have two masters, thought A. For either he will hate the one, thought B, and love the other, thought C, or he will hold to the one, thought C repeated, and despise the other, thought B repeated. You cannot serve God and mammon, thought A repeated. So this gives us an idea of what love is. When we look at those, that, that middle part of that chiastic structure, he, uh, he will love the one or he will be loyal to the one. So Jesus here associates love with loyalty or holding onto, cleaving to. It is not that sentimentalism. It is that choice to be loyal to, that choice to cleave to him. Furthermore, it is contrasted with hate. God and mammon are two different extremes. If you choose to be loyal to mammon, you will eventually hate God. But if you choose to be loyal to God, if you choose to cleave to God, if you choose to hold on to him, you will eventually despise not money, but the concept, the idea, the practice of being obsessed with money. Slavery to mammon. Who is your master? I remember on Facebook a young man posting, uh, putting a post up that said, I quit cigarettes for half a day, but I, I resumed because I felt I was going to kill someone. I said, wow, <laughs> can you imagine, imagine what that, that was like? Uh, he has attempted several times uh, to quit, but it is the, the withdrawal symptoms were just too great for him. Those who are addicted, uh, those who are enslaved by cigarettes, the, the day, the mind is consumed when they attempt to quit with anxiety, with irritability, with restlessness, with difficulty in concentrating, with depression, with mood fluctuations, and, and with, with frustration, with anger, and with insomnia. These are the things that come when one is addicted to these things. Do you know anybody like that? Maybe I shouldn't ask that. Uh, I, I knew the young man who posted that. But this is what it can be like when we are a slave to mammon. When we realize we are a slave, and when we attempt to break free of that slavery, we will go through certain, through similar withdrawal symptoms. 
we will go through some of the same experiences. Anxiety. Where am I going to get the things that I need? Depression. Because maybe I need to give this up. Maybe I need to give that up. There is a great deal of insecurity when mammon is our master. Those who pursue mammon, those who pursue or are obsessed with wealth, do so because they want tomorrow to be taken care of. They want to have no sense of insecurity about their standing and about the things they have. But the truth is, we will never have enough riches to guarantee tomorrow. We will never have that. First of all, wealth is of a fleeing nature. You've heard about these big time football players that get these humongous contracts, you know, five million a year, 10 million a year or so. Well, some have done studies on these quarterbacks that have these huge contracts and have followed them for years after they retire, years after their last game. And they've discovered that roughly 16% of these retired NFL players end up bankrupt within 12 years after retirement. Can you imagine that? Getting $5 million a year and then in a decade or a little more after, filing for bankruptcy. Wealth is of a fleeing nature. Second, the reason why tomorrow we can't, well, mammon does not guarantee tomorrow. To each of us, eternity is promised, but to none of us is tomorrow promised. And that's important to note. I remember I was in IT for 26 years, and I remember uh, a man who uh, worked an extra, a few extra years after retirement age and said, I, I want retirement income to be a, a little more cozy. And, and I understand that. He, so he worked for a few more years, uh, and then he had the uh, retirement. We had what's called the bang out, where everybody in the office took their stapler or their pens and banged against the metal object as he walked out of that, out of that uh, hallway one more time. We found out the next day that he died. The next day he died. Wealth is of a fleeing nature. Tomorrow is not promised to us. And there's only a limited amount of wealth in the world. Did you know that? And day by day, moment by moment, people are contending for that limited amount. And so you may have a hill of gold today, but someone may come along and sweep that away from under your feet. It is of a fleeing nature. And tomorrow is not promised to us. And if we want to keep it, we've got to contend for it. There is no peace. There is no assurance. There is no security when we are serving mammon. Who then is your master? If you choose to make Christ your master, if you choose to serve God, there is a great deal of benefit with that. And one person I remember telling me that, uh, you know, pastors do not get a, a high salary, he said, but their retirement is out of this world. And I told him that can be the same for every one of us. That can be the same for every one of us. But when we make God our master, we have a master who uses no force. No force. He does not compel you to do his will. He does not press himself on you. God is a gentleman. God is one who will inspire you. God is one who will convict you. God is one who will impress you. God is one who will reveal things to you. But God will never choose for you. God will never use coercion. Would you like to have a boss that you work for that doesn't use coercion? We're talking about someone so better than any earthly boss. God never forces us. God never controls us. When we serve God, we serve a master who is looking out for our own good. We're serving one who knows what is best for us and points us in the path of what is best for us. 
Though we may see a very small fraction of that road and say, this is not good, he sees the entire road and says, this is what is good for you. And I want what is good for you. We just dedicated little Robert. And I, I can bet my entire retirement account <laughs> that Chad and Kelly want what is best for that little boy. They want what is best for him. They want him to be his best. They want him to achieve great things for himself and for others. That is the human heart. Imagine what the divine heart wants for his children. God is a master who does not use force. God is a master who looks for our, for our good. And God is a master that we do not need to contend over with others. If we had a, a big pile of $100 bills here, some of us may run over there and fight with others to get as many as we can. We don't need to do that with God. I can be praying to God. You can be praying to God. And guess what? We are not contending over his attention. You ever notice that sometimes all the phone calls come in at once? Did you ever notice that? Yeah, I get a call, and, and it's an important call. I need to talk to this person. And then suddenly, three or four calls come in while I'm on that line. I can't talk to them at that time. They've got to wait. So there, there are times that contention goes on for, uh, for my attention, but that is never the case with God. We could all be praying to him at the same time. He's not going to say, oh, Debbie, ho hold on, I, I, I can't talk to you right now. Someone else is praying with me. Uh, Joyce, maybe later, okay, let's try again in a few minutes. The line is busy. He never does that. He is ready to hear you, and he's ready to hear you now. God is a master who has unlimited bounties to supply us. He is not limited in what he holds. He says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. He has un numerous ways uh, of answering our needs. And God is a master who will never leave us. No one can take him away from you. No one can come in in the middle of night and take your faith away, take your relationship away with the Lord. Jesus said, behold, I am with you even until the end of the age. And that promise is real. That promise is real. God cannot be stolen away from us. When we serve God, we serve a master who assures us. He assures us. Heaven and earth, he said, will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. I remember when I came to Christ, I was a young man who had deep-rooted insecurities. I didn't know that. I didn't consider that. If you came up to me and said, uh, Mr. Lewis, you have some deep deal of insecurities. And I said, bring it on, man. Show me. I, I was that really stubborn, uh, what do you call it? Uh, stubborn, what, what's the word you used? I can't remember anyway. But when I came to Christ, he showed me how insecure I truly was. But he showed me I am that way because I am not trusting in him. I wanted to prove to people that, that I am good, that I stand out, that I have some type of gift, I'm unique uh, than from other people. Uh, but for some reason, people didn't believe that. For some reason, people didn't listen to me. And so I tried to prove that even more. And for some reason, people didn't want to be around me. But when I found Christ, I discovered that there is one who sees something good in me. Not because of some, who I was at that time, but of who, he was, who I, he was going to make me. Does that make sense? And the Bible says that he that overcomes has a white stone in heaven written with a new name on it that no one knows but they themselves. You are unique in the eyes of God. You are special in the eyes of God. You are someone that he sees great potential in if we cooperate with him and allowing him to mold our character. This is the master we will have if we serve God. He is a master 
who gives us peace. A peace that is not based on what we can do, but a peace that is based on what he has done, based on what he is doing, and based on what he is going to do. When we make God our master, we have a master who uses no force, a master who looks out for a good, a master who does not need, we do not need to contend with over others, a master who has unlimited bounties to supply our needs, a master who will never leave us, a master who gives us assurance, a master who gives us peace. But there's one other benefit I especially want to bring out. When we make God our master, then we become masters of mammon. Either we are slaves to it or it is a slave to us. If we do not make our money our slave, then it becomes our master. When we surrender all to Christ, when we say, Lord, here I am, I am yours, we are including in that our wallets, our purses, our, check, our checkbook, our debit card, our credit card. We are laying those all on the table, and by the power of God, we will rule over them, and they will not rule over us. When we choose to use our money, first and foremost, to advance the kingdom of heaven, then we rise above temptation. We rise above anxiety. We rise above insecurity. We rise above uncertainty because we know we are serving a God who is seeking to bless us, seeking to benefit us. As our faith in Christ grows, our anxiety over our finances decrease. Who is your master? When I began studying the Bible, when I began considering Christianity, as I read the Bible, I, I was convicted. It was teaching that we should be returning a tithe to the Lord. But I was just getting by. I had three children. Well, three ch one child and two were about to uh, where I knew we were going to come, uh, and, I, and we were just getting by. How can I return a tithe to the Lord? And I was very reluctant to do this. So I was trying to find a reason not to do it. Uh, and what I did is I, I typed up a letter and I sent it to what's called the Southern New England Conference. That's the conference over Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. You notice I said Connecticut first. Uh, and I wrote them a letter and said, have you ever, you know, uh, have you ever had issues with tithe that is returned? Have people ever exploited things? And they wrote me a letter back. I was hoping they'd say, oh, no, there's never been any problem. I said, okay, I know that they're lying now. But they told me of three incidences that took place over the years. I said, wow, these are honest people. These are honest people. And I became more convicted uh, that I should be doing this. I had a desire for financial security. But in my walk with the Lord, I came to know him more fully, came to trust him more fully, and I surrendered my checkbook to him. And I've never had any regret since then. When we let Jesus sit upon the throne of the heart, we will not necessarily be free from struggles, free from doubts, free from uncertainties, but... When we surrender all to him, he frees us from slavery to mammon. He frees us from insecurity. He frees us from anxiety, step by step, little by little, more and more. And he gives us a life of peace. We think that we are in control by holding on to these things. But the truth is, when we hold on to them, we are actually enslaved and subject to anxiety and depression. Today I want to ask you, who is your master? Will you serve one that has no benefits but only harm and uncertainty? Or will you serve one who loves you, who's looking out for your good, 
and who will only do that which you would choose if you saw as he did the end from the beginning. My hope, my prayer for each of us is that our surrender will be entire and our surrender will com be complete. This is my prayer for each of us in Jesus' name. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our